hello, and welcome to this week's episode of The Horse Trainers, starring Jason and Bronwyn Irwin. On The Horse Trainers, Jason and Bronwyn will be covering horse training topics such as problem solving, advancing horses, starting colts, working on rider confidence, improving performance horses, liberty training, and more. Now let's saddle up and get started. I'm Jason. And I'm Bronwyn. Welcome to our season four finale of The Horse Trainers. This past season, you joined us on the road at a few clinics. We did some groundwork, desensitization, did some Western jumping, and you also saw us train horses how to cross water, as well as barrel racing, pole bending, and Jason touched on young horses as well. Now for this final episode, it's going to be just a little bit different. We're going to take you around our operation and show you some of our horses and just basically how we run things around here. a few folks writing us asking questions about our breeding program, when we foal out our mares, when the stallions go in with the mares, those types of things. Now with our outfit here we don't breed outside mares, all the mares that are bred the stallions are owned by us. So we pasture breed our mares with our stallions and we have three different studs that go out and they all go out with individual bands of mares. And our uh, operation here, it's a little bit of a chess game every time we go to move horses because we have to shuffle them around in such a way that no stallion is on the other side of a fence with another stallion or other mares that may be in heat so that we don't get into any trouble and stuff like that. But anyways, our studs go out usually about mid-May with their bands of mares. We foal out just before they go, the mares go out to pasture or just as they're going out to pasture for the most part. Now we always do have a few stragglers that are born a little bit later in the year, but uh, that just seems to be something that happens no matter how we go about it. But anywho, when we wean, we usually wean them at about five months old, give or take. Now, how we go about that is, instead of weaning them all in one shot, we'll usually wean a little group at a time. So we may go in and wean the biggest three or four or five, something along that line, and they'll go into box stalls either individually or we'll maybe put two in a stall just so they have some company. The stalls that they go in all are open enough on the sides that they can touch noses with the foals in the next stall so they feel like they do have a friend by them. That way they're not as upset being separated from their mothers. So we usually give them a couple days just to sort of settle in and from there we start handling them. The main thing that I think that we want to get done is the 
Well, obviously the halter breaking, we want to get them where they lead. We want to get them where they start to tie. I think that's something that's very easy when foals are young, yet can be very difficult later on in life. If anyone's ever dealt with a horse that's full grown and doesn't know how to tie, they know how much fun that is or isn't uh, to put up with. But anyways, we get them tying pretty early. We also get them where they're picking up their feet. And again, that's one of those things that it's not that big a deal when they're little, but gets to be a lot bigger deal when they get bigger. Now, our babies, we do not, well, we do spend a lot of time with them in a way. We're out around them quite a bit, so they're used to people. They're very comfortable with people. But at the same time, we're not really bringing them in to handle them individually until weaning time. And not that a person can't, but we just have so many of them that it's one of those things that we only have so much time. But other than that, we just want to get the babies where they have good manners, they're respectful, and they're good to deal with when they're weaned. One other thing, if we do have time and if the weather isn't too rough, we do like to give them one or two baths as they, uh, a little bit after they're weaned, and that maybe a week or so after they've been separated. And we just find the bathing, obviously it's one of those things that it just gets them used to one more thing. However, it's also really good for getting them quiet. They usually don't like the first time, but usually by the second time, a person will notice a big improvement in them. And usually it's just one of those things, again, when it's done when they're little, it'll just be that much easier throughout that horse's entire lifetime. After that, usually what we do is move on and wean the next little group of foals and then start working with them. We find that we just get the basics down on them and then leave them alone for a little while. Then we go back and spend quite a bit more time with them once we've gotten all the way through the whole group. And sometimes we find that by handling them and then giving them that little bit of a break and then coming back to them, that works really, really well. They just seem like they get accustomed to people, but uh, they're not overwhelmed at the same time. So that's kind of our basic uh, weaning program from there as they go along from the weaning point up to the time that they're yearlings. It's usually just more of the same. We don't really do anything other than that except for trailer loading. We do like to get the babies and the early yearlings loading in the trailers. And again, once they can do that when they're little, it just sets a habit that's pretty easy throughout the rest of that horse's entire lifetime. Not that again, a horse can't be trained to load really well when they're older, but when they're little, everything is new to them. So whatever you show them will be the way that they remember. Whatever you show them in the beginning will become their new normal. So if getting on and off the trailer is super easy for them when they're little, it just carries over. And that's just one less thing you have to deal with later on. This is a mare and foal that we're really high on. We've had this mare since she was a baby and she really turned out to be one of our best brood mares. We've been nothing but happy with her. And actually her stud colt from last year, he was good enough that we held him back to be a potential future stallion prospect. And this filly here, she would stop trying to hide behind the mare. I guess you can see seven eighths of her, so she is pretty good, take my word for the rest of it. But she's a really classy thing and I think that's something that is so important with your fillies that you're thinking about maybe keeping for future brood mares. You want something that has a lot of body but you want them classy as well. You can get some of them that are, have a lot of body but they're maybe just a little bit coarse and you get other ones that are super classy but they're maybe just a little bit delicate. Where with her here I feel like she's sort of the best of both. She's a stylish thing. Are you talking same. about me, Jason, or the horse? Yes, I'm not talking about Bron when I'm talking about the horse. <laughs> and that, but uh, we really, really like this one. Lots of blue roan hind ends in this picture. And this year we were hoping we would get a bunch of fillies and we got three quarter stud colts. So we were absolutely tickled with the foals themselves, but I sure wouldn't have minded if there's a few more fillies in the mix. Yeah. 
we have one mare that always throws the friendliest foal every single year and this year is absolutely no exception this guy here i think he wanted to crawl in our pocket when he was about two hours old he's been the biggest suck on the place ever since the moment he hit the ground what was funny though about him is even though he was born in the early summertime he was born with a really heavy coat so he looked like he was all ready for winter with hair this long now he finally shed out into his summer coat and he's a nice shade of blue but early on it looked like he was wearing a buffalo robe everywhere he went but uh, he's probably not one of our bigger foals I would expect him to probably finish up 15 15 one hands but he's hands down the suck of the bunch and his brother from last year was exactly the same way that he is. As you can see, the other horses are leaving and he doesn't care. He would be an easy horse to steal. I will say that is his one problem. You don't have to try very hard to be his friend. He will gladly make friends with anybody that will pet him and spend any time with him. He's a pretty good fella. So this is one of our stallions here. His paper name is North Star Smoking Gun. We call him Smoke. And he's just done a tremendous job for us. He has babies that are big, gentle, quiet, super easy to get along with, super easy to start. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of folks don't really know or don't give a lot of credit to. And that is understanding that temperament is extremely heritable. If you get a family of horses that are consistently quiet they just produce more horses that are quiet and easy to start. If you get a group of horses where everything is spun, generally they're just gonna keep producing more and more of those. Now that's not to say the hot horses can't be nice, and that I'm definitely not saying that, but at the same time, if you can have one that's very easy to train and one that's difficult to train, once you start very many, you start to appreciate the ones that just wanna be nice and gentle about it. And he's really great in a herd environment with his mares and foals too, because as you can see, his foals are coming up to him and he becomes kind of their buddy or their babysitter. When their mom's had enough of them, they always come and hang out with smoke. So I guess he's got somewhere to go or he just doesn't want me to look in the camera. He wants to be the star here, <laughs> but he is very friendly and he's, he's a great dad out here to his foals because he hangs out with them so much. It's sometimes funny to look out here, you'll see him and four or five foals wandering around with him. And it's like he's taking them on a little field trip. This guy here, he's a big blue roan stud colt and his mom's off in the background here. Usually she tries to have the first foal of the year and for the past few years, that's actually been right on track. Now, um, this guy, he has a, a sister who's actually won a national championship in Western dressage. So I'm pretty sure that uh, even though he's hiding back here, I'm sure that he will be a showstopper and do well in whatever area people want him to uh, excel in. Now this is taking stealing the show to a new level. <laughs> here. And here comes smoke again. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to get him out of the way because he has gotten in the way almost every shot we've done. If you get an opportunity to be around a big group of horses, one thing I would suggest is really watch their body language and how they interact with each other. That gives a person a pretty good idea of how horses communicate, and then a person can take that knowledge and apply it to their own horsemanship and their own training. Now that's not to say you're gonna be able to go out and imitate a horse and convince another horse that you're the same thing that isn't going to happen but at the same time just spending time around them seeing their little intricacies how they communicate with each other those types of things it just really i think helps a person understand what a horse is thinking there'll be a lot of communication and a lot of different little horse conversations within a pretty short period of time if you watch a big group of horses together so just spending some time like that can really help a person in their own horsemanship Another thing is you always want to be aware when you're around a big group of horses like this, you want to have eyes in the back of your head 
and just be watching them even though they seem friendly and they're your friend they may be having a little conflict that you're not realizing with another horse or a horse on the far side could be getting a little bit um, silly and maybe chase some into you so just when you're around a big group of horses always kind of have a little bit of an eye like right here we have some horses coming through they're hustling just step out of the way and this is a really cool colt <laughs> really cool when you're a foal there ain't nothing better than having a nap in the sunshine on a nice summer day Now, when you go up to pet a foal for the first time or scratch on them, the one thing that I like to do is an approach and retreat type method. So what I mean by that is I'll go up and see if they act just a little bit curious, try to read their body language a little, but I'm not going to move in and just reach for them right away. I'm just going to let them get used to me in their space. As you can see, this uh, little filly here has kind of looked at me already and said, what are you doing here? Then I'll just kind of let her investigate me and then move away for a half a second. Then I'll come a little bit back into her space. And if I'm gonna scratch her, the first place that I'm gonna go for is just around the shoulder area. It's not that uh, an aggressive of a kind of a movement in towards them. And then I'll just work off of that. So I'm gonna scratch and then take it away, scratch. She must be liking it because all of her friends are leaving. Whew and then take it away. So I'll just keep that up until I can kind of move up and scratch them just a little bit more up their neck. So one thing that we've been asked about quite a bit is whip cracking. Now this isn't exactly horse training, but it is related to it because we do use whip cracking quite a bit here to get our horses used to loud noises, things whirling around their ears, and just generally to get them quieter. So I'm just gonna go over a few of the basic tips about working with whips and trying to get the feel of them. So anyways, there are two main types of whips that folks use when they're uh, working around horses and livestock in general. The one that's probably the most common that most people know is a bull whip and the second most common is an Australian stock whip. An Australian stock whip basically is just a whip that has a bit longer handle like this one does. The advantage of the Australian stock whip is the handle is a little bit longer, so when you're swinging it overhead, the long handle just gets the whip farther away from you. So I do find this is the whip that I am better with uh, when it comes to working around livestock. So anywho, especially riding a horse. Now, tip number one, if you're gonna crack whips around your horse, get really good at it on the ground before you get anywhere near your horse. Because if you're sitting on your horse, swinging the whip around and trying to crack it and you're not very good with it, the odds are pretty high you're gonna accidentally flick your horse with the whip and then you're probably gonna go for a really merry ride, but it's gonna probably be a short one. So anyways, get good on the ground first. So I'm just gonna start off mentioning two things not to do, or should say two cracks that people try to do that don't actually work. The one is when folks try to throw the whip like a baseball. And what I mean by that is they'll have the whip out kind of behind them and they throw it out to the side almost like it's again if they were throwing a ball. What happens with this, and I'm going to do it in slow motion so it doesn't hurt too much, they'll take throw and the whip comes around behind them and will hit them. So if, especially if you're using a long whip, you'll swing the whip out like this all of a sudden you'll, there'll be about a one second pause and you'll feel, feel a big snap right in the middle of the back of your back. So definitely don't do that one. The other one that folks tend to do is if they're nervous about getting hit, they hold the whip out in front of them and go like this. And then you see them suck back from it because they're worried they're gonna get hit. And chances are they're going to get hit. This is one you don't wanna do either because if the whip is any longer than about two feet, which they all are, there's enough distance excuse me, there's a short enough space between you and the end of the whip that it's gonna find a way to come back and get you. So the simple one to start off with is this one. Like so. You wanna have the whip out here just a little bit and you want it going up and down beside your body. Don't be on an angle. So don't bring the whip up across here or out here. You wanna be straight with it. Now I'm gonna show this one from the side. 
where you change direction is about here. You swing the back, whip back to here and then go ahead and go forward. Just like that. And you can play around with this one for quite a while before you get the feel of it, but that's the one I would probably suggest that a person start with. Now this one can actually be turned into two cracks, which I'll do just right here. The first one, and then come back and do it behind you. So the first one is here, then you're gonna to swing to about here, and then come back again. Kind of like so. And that's really handy if you're gonna be on a horse's back because you have a way to keep flicking the whip and keep cracking. If you only do this one, you have to stop and start again every time. So it's not quite as handy when you're uh, horseback. The other one that you see a lot, especially in the movies, is this one. Kind of like that. And the trick here is you're going to swing counterclockwise to about here. And that's when you're going to reverse directions. Kind of like so. So those are the few basic cracks that I think are really handy to know. There's all kinds of trick ones and you can get really tricky with it if you want to. You can get two whips and really go to town. But those few there are the main ones that will kind of get you on your way with whip cracking. Again, get really, really good with them on the ground before, before you ever think about doing it on a horse's back. Also, make darn sure that you also get your horse accustomed to the whip with you on the ground before you start doing it on their back. If you get on their back and start doing it right away, you can scare even the quietest horse in the world, get them used to it on the ground, get them really comfortable with that, and then it's not so big a transition. So we hope you folks really enjoyed the final episode of this season. Keep going for your horsemanship goals, and hopefully we'll uh, see you on your horsemanship journey somewhere down the road. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.